Thanks, obviously, to the Staglin family. It's a real honor to be here, and thank you for the support. I need to give credit to my better half. This is actually artwork from my wife, Jessica Abels. I think it accurately depicts kind of the thematics of what I'm going to talk about. And for the question about animal models, this is a, a, an artistic rendition of a bullying model, which I think is very relevant to mental illness. So on my way over here, I was thinking about what depression means. Actually, before I got on the plane, I did an image search on Google for depression, just single word depression. And these are some of the images that came up. And I think this is a very good uh, description of how we think about depression. It almost made me feel, as I was looking at these images, the pain in the, in, in the head that these individuals are feeling. And, and really, the behavioral manifestation of depression, obviously, is due to some pathological state of the brain itself. However, I think what this imagery does is it prevents us from thinking about depression as a whole body disease. Um, and what I mean by this is that depression doesn't only happen in your head. Depression happens throughout your entire body. There's biological changes in many organ systems. And evidence from other fields of medicine have pointed to a very inter inter intimate connection between our mind and our body. And when we start to look at prevalence rates across other diseases, there's a, a large increase in the prevalence of uh, depression and related mental illnesses in things like heart disease, it's up to 20%. Uh, diabetes is up to 20 to 30%. Multiple sclerosis is all, all the way up to 50% for depression prevalence. And rheumatoid arthritis is also fairly high at 39%. Now, these are all associated with changes in the inflammatory status within one's body to varying degrees. Uh, multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, for example, are classic autoimmune di diseases that are characterized by a large increase in the inflammatory state within your body. So what is inflammation? Inflammation is, is one of the first responses. I think most of us are probably familiar with this of the body. Uh, when exposed to either infection or, um, or, or just um, injury itself. There's chemical factors such as interleukins that are released by the injured cells, which establish a physical barrier, really, so that the body can then engulf those pathogens or things that are entering the body that aren't supposed to be there, and then clear them. So preventing you from getting uh, even more sick or more damaged. And in order to do this, the, the, the body has thought up a pretty ingenious strategy. These, this is an artist's rendition of the cells of the immune system. Um, and what I just want to highlight from this, because it'll become important later on in the talk, is that all of our body's primary defenses, our white blood cells, are derived from pluripotent stem cells that are localized within our bone marrow. So these stem cells then divide, they create two major classes of blood cells. One, well, they, they create all the major classes of blood cells, of white blood cells is what I should say. On the left-hand side, the neutrophils and the monocytes. Think about these as the firefighters that rushed into the, the trade towers at 9-11. This is the first line of defense. If a, if a pathogen invades your body, these two types of cells rush over to it in order to cordon off the pathogen, engulf it, and remove it from your system. On the right-hand side, think about these as the more sustained central intelligence agency. These are the ones that are operating in response to a vaccine. So this is to confer a longer-term immunity to pathogens. What I'm going to focus, about, uh, what I'm going to focus on is, is what is called the innate immune system, so the first responders, because we found evidence that there may be a dysfunction in these first responders in people with depression. And also, I'm a mouse doctor as well, so in mice with depression. The question is, how does this peripheral signal affect the brain? Because it still has to get into the brain. Uh, and this is just a, an example from an article I found earlier in the week showing two, exam two ways in which this can happen. One is that the, the monocytes themselves can enter the brain. And that's shown right here. They differentiate, but I won't get into that boring detail. The other way, which is the one that I'm going to talk about mostly, is that these monocytes are circulating in your body at all times. They can release their chemical triggers, their chemical inflammatory signals. And then these signals are so small that they can easily pass into the brain through small spaces between the epithelial cells and affect brain circuitry. There's a long 
list of evidence correlating not just in prevalence rates for depression, but in the specific symptoms that people report that have inflammatory diseases. Uh, in the bottom left is a picture of a, of a young woman with lupus, and you can see this typical butterfly pattern of, of redness. Um, lupus is associated with a number of symptoms of depression, as is multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis. So this was evidence that um, possibly something that was wrong with the immune system was infiltrating brain and causing symptoms of mood disorders. So getting at the question of how we study depression in a mouse. <laughs> we chose, there's a number of models. We chose a model slightly different than uh, what Colleen chose. Um, we chose the bully model. This is a situation uh, which we've all experienced where an animal that's larger and more aggressive is forced to share a room with another animal. And the other animal, the intruder mouse, gets physically attacked for a few minutes each day, and then for the remainder of that 24-hour period, they get housed on the other side of the cage. So they're not getting consistent physical attack, but they have this uh, psychological stressor where they know that the following day that big mouse is going to come in and attack them for a few minutes. Over a 10-day period, these mice develop a really severe but interesting phenotype in relation to psychiatric illness. Now, I don't want to call these mice depressed because I think that this mouse model is relevant to post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, uh, maybe bipolar. I don't know if Colleen has any evidence. Um, but what it does do, it induces symptoms that we think are relevant to human depression. And I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on these two symptoms. These are anhedonia and social avoidance. We all know what these things are. Anhedonia is the lack of a, an ability to experience things as being pleasant. Natural things like sex and sucrose, or for us it would be Coca-Cola. Um, and, and, and socially avoiding, right? When we're depressed or we're stressed, we tend to uh, uh, not want to have social contact with others. We tend to hide and and stay out of social situations. And this is just a, a, a visual to let you know um, how we would measure these things. It's very simple. This is just an animal that's sipping soda out of its uh, sucrose dipper. And then this is an animal that's avoiding, um, in this case, the animal that had attacked it. But it also avoids other non-threatening cage mates, which I think is an important point. What's also important about this model is that if every one of us in this we're not in a room today, but under this tent, were to experience a stressful event, not all of us would develop a syndrome, right? We would split probably between two major groups, maybe. One we would call resilient, one we would call susceptible, and it would be across, across a continuum. This is a description of, of, of our model and how it can split between these two populations of susceptible or resilience. This is based on the amount of social avoidance that the animals show, but I want to highlight that the animals also split based on this anhedonia phenotype. And another one that I didn't mention, but this is this metabolic syndrome that they also develop. And the social interaction ratio, simply put, the lower the social interaction, the more they avoid, the higher the social interaction ratio, the more they interact. Now, the first thing that we did in my lab, because I think that it's critically important, what the field has lacked up until this point is biomarker evidence for the disease. And what we've, what we've failed to do is we've failed to identify the important changes in humans first to then come back to our mouse models and study function. So I was lucky enough to have a collaborator at uh, Cambridge, Dr. Sabine Bon and her team of clinicians, who had uh, collected 300 blood samples from patients with depression, um, including both first episode and chronic major depression. And then we had lots of samples of our, of our mouse depression model. We ran this through what's called a multiplexed ELISA. This measures two or 3,000 protein analytes that are in all of our bodies. And it measured it simultaneously. And what I hope you can appreciate from this, these are all pro-inflammatory factors that are found in all of our bloodstreams. And if you look, with people that have chronic relapsing major depression, there's a huge elevation in a lot of these pro-inflammatory factors. Some of them overlap nicely with our susceptible mice, which shows us that we're, we're, we're using a model now that's 
act at least somewhat reflective of the human state. But I don't think we're ever going to get at a diagnostic tool or a way to predict using this type of an approach. The changes that I'm talking about are probably not large enough to account for individual variation that we all have within our own bodies. So what we want to do is we want to develop a diagnostic test. And, um, you know, I'm from New York, and I think in Jersey it might be okay to take an animal out in the back and, or a person out in the back and give them a little uh, stress test of our own, but we have to come up with something that's non-invasive. <laughs> we have to come up with something non-invasive. So what we did was we, we took a blood sample from our, mouse, from our mice prior to the onset of any stressful experience. And in the left-hand panel, what, what we do is, we're, this is just showing you that we separate out blood monocytes from the, from the whole blood. This is whole blood. This little buffy coat white layer here, those are the, the white blood cells that I'm talking about. And what we do is we put them into this dish, we keep them alive, and then we inject a toxin. Because if you remember what I said at the very beginning, these cells respond to toxins and pathogens. So we inject this toxin, and then it allows us to measure the release of these chemical peptides, these chemical factors, these inflammatory factors. On the left-hand panel, what I'm showing you is the increase in these inflammatory factors in susceptible and resilient mice in our dish. Right? So what you can see is before any stressful experience, our mice that ultimately would develop this depression syndrome had a hyperinflammatory response to that toxin in a dish. This was also true after just an acute stressor. So we put the animal in, we had a single social defeat episode, and you get a massive induction of interleukin-6. This was uh, compelling, but it was not proof that this was controlling the pathology. The next thing we did, and this was uh, part of the original IMRO uh, application, was to, we, we injected a new potential therapeutic. This therapeutic is actually an antibody. Everybody's familiar with antibodies. They normally interact in our body and help with the process of clearing pathogens as well. But in this case, this antibody is something that we've designed. We can inject it into the blood. It doesn't cross into the brain, so it has no central side effects. All it does is it picks up all of the interleukin-6 and it sequesters it in our peripheral body, preventing it from ever getting into our brain. And what you can see, I hope, is that the social interaction ratio goes back up almost to normal levels, as does that measure of anhedonia. They start drinking their soda at a much higher level. But to truly show causation, because this approach can have many uh, secondary effects by blocking an inflammatory signal in the, in the periphery, it may be affecting other systems. It still doesn't prove that the peripheral immune system is controlling our behavior. So what I wanted to do, and this, was, um, this is preliminary, you guys are the first people that have seen this, and this was actually the first experiment I did with uh, the IMRO award that started in July. We took animals that had completed 10 days of chronic social defeat stress. So these were animals that were measured to be susceptible. These were also animals that had high interleukin-6 release in that dish experiment that I showed earlier. And we harvested their, the stem cells from their bone marrow. And if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I said that the bone marrow stem cells are the ones that produce all of our white blood cells. And if people have ever had family that, uh, or, or friends with uh, leukemia or other types of cancers, this is actually a treatment that we use in humans. We irradiated a, sep a separate group of mice. These were control mice that had no uh, pathology, got rid of their peripheral immune system, and then we re-exposed the immune cells from our susceptible mice and allow that to repopulate the animal's body. We do that simply by injecting it through a vein in the retroorbital socket here. And to prove to you that this happens, don't in any way think of, uh, of the exact details of this. I'm just going to simplify it for you right now. Six weeks after we inject the stem cells into the retroorbital socket, the, we can measure the donor white blood cells versus the recipient's own immune, cells, uh, own immune cells. And what you can see is that these cells have almost completely repopulated. So they now have an immune system from a susceptible depressed mouse. And this is the first 
experiment, and the, and the results are extremely exciting, although I want to caution you, we need to repeat it. What you can see is that if we expose these susceptible donor mice now, these are controls that got susceptible donor blood cells, they now have a reduced social interaction ratio, so they're avoiding these other organisms to a much greater extent. And they also have a reduced soda preference or sucrose preference. So I think that this is the first proof positive that our peripheral immune system can act in concert with our brain circuitry to control mood, mood disorders. And with that, I want to thank the people who really do the work in my lab. Dr. Georgia Hodes is the person that's really taken this project to, uh, to a point where we can start uh, answering some really interesting questions. And of course, big thanks to Emro, the Staglin family, Brandon's amazing, and uh, Linda and Cindy for great, organi great organizational skills in helping this to work well. So, thank you.